Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, good morning. I heard this is the uh, rowdy crew. <laughs> well, blessings uh, to you. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Thank you for uh, even your friendship and your conversation. Thank you for just being who you are as well. Well, congratulations on 70 years of ministry. Amen. I do want to uh, kind of jump right into things, but just want to share with you as a church the blessing that you have been to my family and I. Uh, I was telling Pastor Ryan, I was like, this is not the uh, first time that we have been here to Calvary. Uh, we've been to fall festival events. We've seen, uh, I forget the comedian's name, but Michael something. We've come to those. We've come to some marriage enrichment things. Um, we've seen Easter plays. We've been here for um, candlelight services and everything as well. So we've certainly been here to Calvary a lot. You know, I'm a chaplain, as he had mentioned, with the Delaware National Guard, again, currently serving on active duty orders at Dover Air Force Base, but I'm, I'm here in Delaware. A lot of people, um, they'll say, well, where are you from? I'm from Chester, Pennsylvania, but I, I guess I'm a Delawarean. They tell me after how many years, 10, 15 years or something like that, but well, been here since at least 1996. You know, the title of this message today um, is Public victories, but private battles. Public victories, but private battles. I'm not gonna to share too much about military, but I will say this is that I will ask that I know there's a few persons, probably a lot of persons that's in the congregation or that are members of Calvary um, that have either served or currently are serving in the military. But there's one group of people that I would like to recognize that sometimes we forget about them, and that's the family of the military members. And so can we give a round of applause for the spouses and the children that are there to support our service members? So one of the things that I wanted to share and encourage you as a church, and I know that you're doing it, but I would like to just kind of share it again, is meet our military members and their families where they are. Um, our military members have a lot of public victories, but also a lot of private battles, amen? So I'm one of those amen preachers, so I don't know where the amen corner is at, if it's all <laughs> uh, but, but again, I'm not gonna share a whole lot about military, but I did wanna kind of sow that seed um, if need be, is that meet our military members and their families where they are. They have a lot of public victories, but they have a lot of also private battles as well. I would like to sow this seed in your heart as well. What do you think of when you see a service member in the uniform? And I just want to kind of like leave that there, kind of like the Bible says, pause and think of that, Selah. But what do you think of when you see a military person in their uniform? Remember that, public victories but private battles. Well, I wanna share a little bit about myself. Um, as Pastor Ryan shared, born and raised in a small city about an hour and 15 minutes away from here, Chester, Pennsylvania. Um, there I went to Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade. My middle school experience was pretty amazing. I was in talent shows, I played basketball, everybody played basketball in the city, and I ran track. So those areas were my public victories. But in private, I struggled with my identity and I also struggled with my self-worth. So then I graduated from Catholic school and I went on to public school. Ninth grade was a very low point for me. No longer was I this star athlete, no longer was I kind of at the top of my class. So the private battles that I had in regards to my identity and my self-worth just got real. And so throughout high school, I began to run track. I realized I wasn't good enough to play basketball on the public school level. There's one thing to be good, what we used to call it CYO, the Catholic school, uh, school league, but to play at the public school level was a little different. 
So my public victories around the 10th grade, end of that year, they begin to come back. I begin to get really good in running track. I was in the newspaper, I got medals, I got awards, I had a chance to travel with AAU. And because of my popularity, I started being checked out by some people as well, if y'all know what I mean. So this lasted for over about a year and a half when by my senior year, I found myself back in that place of private battles. My injury impacted my passion and my relationships didn't turn out quite the way that I thought that they were going to. So I personally began to write the end of my story. So growing up, there was this movie called Boys in the Hood and there was a guy named Ice Cube and a few other people that played in this movie. In a weird way, this movie inspired me. In high school, I wrote an English paper, and it was titled Growing Up in the Hood. It was about a young man, and that young man was myself, who was on the right track, was on his way to college, but he gets gunned down by being in the wrong place at the right time. That's the story that I wrote. At that time, I did not see myself making it beyond the age of 21. So then late in my senior year of high school, I received a partial scholarship to Delaware State University. This was considered a public victory. I was the pers first person in my immediate family that was going to go off to college. Unknown by those that were applauding me, I was struggling with my identity again. Damaged by a broken relationship, I was depressed, I had suicidal thoughts, I was drinking and I was smoking. By my sophomore year in college, I made plans to leave Dell State and go live the life that I felt like that I was big and bad enough to live. So this is when God brought into my life Tremaine. So Tremaine and I, next month, we'll be married for 24 years. Amen. So Tremaine was a Christian. I was not. So back then they said that I was an uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> so Tremaine and I, we both ran track at Delaware State University and if you get a chance to talk to her, she'll share with you her story. I have a side of the story of who was chasing who. It was our sophomore year in college that Tremaine became pregnant with our daughter. And it was in that moment of life that I said, uh-oh, I got a baby on the way. I better get my life together. <laughs> so to be with Tremaine and the baby, I would drive from Chester to Dover to attend church every weekend with no pressure from Tremaine. This is where I'm going to ask you to lean in to the discipleship part. I did not realize it, but each and every time that I attended church with Tremaine and the baby, God was drawing me to himself. But there were some barriers. I did not, not necessarily, I didn't like church people because I thought that church people were, you ever hear this word, hypocrites. I had no idea what hypocrites was. But the word on the street was that church people were hypocrites. But unfortunately, my feelings about how some church people rang true when some people would not acknowledge me as I attended church, but they would pay a lot of attention to the young pregnant lady that I was with. But you know what, I thought, well, maybe it was because of the outfits that I was wearing at church. So if you can picture this outfit, white t-shirt, dress pants, my slick shoes for my prom, I had suspenders that were hanging down. Y'all picturing this? And I had one earring and one ear. Now I know many of y'all are thinking, that sounds like one of those singers from Boys to Men. <laughs> but listen to how God operates. Despite how I felt or even how nervous I was of my commitment to God, God drew me to him and I gave my life to Christ around the age of 19 years old. This is where things really got good. God blessed me with persons that met me 
where I was and discipled me. So keep that image in your head of that young man with this white t-shirt. I did not know what discipleship was, but people took me under their wings and they answered questions that I had like, why do we have so many churches? (laughs) Or what's the difference between a Catholic and a Christian? To fast forward about three years, at the age of 22, Tremaine and I got married and I accepted my call into ministry and it has been amazing ever since then. And so why did I share that about my personal life or why did I even remind you to meet people where they are, whether they're military persons or a young man from Chester, Pennsylvania with one earring in his ear, a white t-shirt, suspenders hanging down, fake snakeskin shoes. (laughs) But I look good. It is this reminder to meet people where they are. And as we share a little bit today, we're going to take a look at the life of Elijah. And we'll see that Elijah, he had a lot of public victories, but he had some private battles. But you know what? God met him right where he was in the midst of his private battles. So if you can stay with me as I give you a quick synopsis before we take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19. I want you to see how God would lead Elijah and then Elijah would respond to God. Stay with me as I just kind of run through this to get to chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2, God says this, Then the Lord said to Elijah, go. Elijah's response in verse 5, So Elijah did as the Lord told him. 1 Kings 17, verse 8, then the Lord said to Elijah, go. This is where he meets with the widow and her son. Verse 10, so Elijah went. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, later on in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab. And guess what Elijah did in verse 2? Elijah went. Up until this point, every time God tells Elijah to go, Elijah goes. Isn't that amazing? But I want you to hold on to that. I'm sure you've heard of this, the gathering at Mount Carmel, the battle that takes place at Mount Carmel. And so there's a point in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19, where God speaks to Elijah, and this is where we meet him at this place of Mount Carmel. And Elijah tells King Ahab, he says, I want you to tell all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel. Along with these people were the 450 prophets of Baal. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, if you can picture this, Elijah is standing in front of the people of Israel and he asks them this question. He says, how much longer Will you waver or how much longer will you hobble between two opinions? He says, if the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Look at the response of the people. But the people were completely silent. Hmm. Imagine standing in front of a group of people and you're trying to convince them, hey, if you're going to follow God, then follow God. But if you're not, go ahead and do what it is. And they don't respond. How does that impact your thinking? And so in verse 22 of first King, uh, chapter 18, Elijah says this in response to the people not saying anything. He says, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Let me go back and repeat this. Elijah stands in front of the people and he says, how much longer will you waver? How much longer will you hobble between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And the people were completely silent. And then Elijah says to the people, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. But Baal has 450 prophets. It's not that Elijah believed that he was the only prophet, 
What he was saying is that I am the only one that is willing to stand up to the prophets of Baal. And so then Elijah has this amazing battle on Mount Carmel. And you know the story of how the gods of Baal, they do not respond, but the God of Israel does. And then in verse 40, pretty much Elijah tells them, slay or slew all of the different prophets of Baal. And now this is where we meet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. Verse 2 says, so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me down and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. This is not the first time that Jezebel has threatened the prophets, but this might be the first time that Elijah has received a threat personally. Things just got real. Verse 3 says this, Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba in a town in Judah and then he left his servant there. Here's my question. If you know anything about the battle on Mount Carmel, how is it that Elijah could have this amazing public victory and one person say one thing to him? that I'm gonna take you out by this time tomorrow. And Elijah begins to run for his life. What was going on within Elijah that struck him with such fear? This phrase that says Elijah was afraid in Hebrew translate to see. The word is ra. In other words, it is to see. And if you can catch this, it means to show self or sight of others. In other words, where it says Elijah was afraid, it means that Elijah looked within himself because there was no one else there to say, Elijah, are you scared? <laughs> And so Elijah took a moment to look within. And when he looked within him, there was something that looked back at him and caused him to flee. Elijah, what's going on? Verse four, then Elijah went on alone into the wilderness traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. Listen to what he says. I have had enough, Lord. Have you ever been there? I didn't had it up to here. <laughs> have you ever said just one more thing? <laughs> and then you know what happens? That one more thing comes. Elijah says that I had had enough. That means that whatever was going on within Elijah, this one threat was the one thing that caused it to overflow and him to say, I'm done. In other words, he was saying that I've been holding on, but this one little thing just caused me to go over capacity to the point where God, I am asking that you will take my life. Wow. If you can just picture this, if you've never seen the battle at the Mount Carmel, Elijah is so confident when he's having this battle with the prophets of Baal that he literally was making fun of them. He was telling them, maybe you need to cry louder. Maybe you need to dance around. Maybe you need to cut yourself. He had so much confidence in doing the work that God had called him to do. But on the inside, something was going on in the life of Elijah. And it didn't just start when Jezebel said, I'm going to take you out by this time tomorrow. Something was brewing within Elijah. And when this woman said what she said, it was the final grain to drop on top. What was his internal battle? He says to God, take 
my life. He says, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Hold on. So what's going on, Elijah? You know, I struggled with this, this portion here. That statement, for I am no better than my ancestors, was Elijah comparing himself to his family that had gone on before him? Was he trying to be better than someone else that was in his life? Was Elijah trying to hold up a standard? But whatever it was, Elijah got to the point where he said, I then had enough. So a moment of reflection for us. Why are we doing what we are doing? Is it possible that sometimes we can get caught up doing the work of God, not for God, but for other people? And when people do not respond the way that they th we think they should, do we say, you know what? I'm the only one. Have you ever felt like that? I'm the only one that shows up on time. I'm the only one that prays. I'm the only one that reads the Bible. I'm the only one. And then when a threat comes, we say, you know what? You know what? I didn't had it up to here. I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. But this area of I am no better than my ancestors that died before me. It seems as if his standard of living was those that went before him. Is your standard someone else? It's a scary place to be. I just, I just want to be. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I used to get so impressed by the deacons at our church. On first Sundays, they would wear all white. And communion Sunday, they would come marching down the aisle. And I said, I just want to be a deacon. <laughs> and the way that they prayed, Father God, and God, we thank you. And Father God, I was like, I just, because I was a new babe in Christ. But then God had to show me, you have your own journey. You have your own assignment. Do not make people your standard. <laughs> have you ever been there? Victory after victory after victory after victory, and then one thing happened and you're done. Where's brother guy? Where's Will? Where's he at? He doesn't come any longer. What's going on? It is possible that what I'm doing is not for God, but it's for people. And when people don't respond, they're not in had it. Imagine instead of Elijah saying, God, take my life, Elijah says, I don't want to be a prophet no more. Can I bring it current? I don't want to be an usher no more. I don't want to work in media no more. I don't want to do this no more. I don't want to greet people no more. Because the last time I greeted people, there was five people that walked past me and didn't say nothing. <laughs> Verse 5 says this. Then Elijah, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping... An angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. Verse 6, he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. God sends an angel to meet Elijah where he was. Suicidal, done, frustrated, and alone because he left his servant in Beersheba and he went on to this place called the wilderness. 
But God sends an angel to meet Elijah right where he is. And this is encouragement for someone. It does not matter where you are. God sees you. He hears you. And he will not leave you sitting under a tree by yourself waiting to die. What I love is that the angel not only comes to him, but he gives Elijah what he needs. He doesn't give Elijah what he think he needs. Elijah needed some nourishment. You know, sometimes it is difficult to even minister to someone when their stomach is growling. Come on, let me pray for you. Can you give me some food first? (laughs) It's hot out here. Can you give me something to drink? The Lord will provide. I know he will. Is he providing through you? But The angel meets Elijah where he is and gives Elijah what he needs in that moment of his life. Verse 7 says this, then the angel of the Lord came again. He kept showing up and he touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. The angel touches him again, this time advising him that he needs to get up and eat some more because his journey ahead of him, he won't be able to make it in the state or the condition that he is in. So that tells me sometimes you've got to tell people like it is. There's one thing to just give someone something and say, hey, you need to take care of this, you know, all that kind of stuff. The next thing is, hey, I'm going to give you this, but you know what? You, you, need to, you need to get up. You can't stay here. You won't survive unless you get up and you eat. And the angel, I can imagine, look at Elijah in the face and saying, Elijah, you won't make it if you don't do what I'm telling you to do. And so sometimes we have to come and say, listen, you're not in a good place. You're not in a good place and you won't make it to your next assignment if you don't do something about it. And so verse 8 says this, so Elijah, he got up and he ate and he drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. The angel gives him enough to get him to a place where he can have an encounter with God. Isn't that what it's all about? God sends someone into our life or sends you in someone's life so that that person can have an encounter with God. It's not about me being their standard. Oh, you know, I I read the Bible uh, 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 five times a day and and I wake up each morning and I pray and I fast and, and I do this and I do that and all that kind of stuff. You know what? That is fantastic. That's wonderful for you. But meet me where I am because we have to be careful that we are not making ourselves the standard for people. We've constantly got to say, hey, 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 I'm glad that I'm here, but I got to keep ushering you to God. Because one day I may not be here. Grandma may not be here. Grandma's prayers may not be here. I've got to keep directing you to God. And so verse 9 says this, there, Elijah, there he came to, where, uh, to a cave where he has spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here? Elijah, go back to what I shared in the beginning. God will say, Elijah, go here. And Elijah went. Go here and Elijah went. God did not tell Elijah to go lay underneath some broom tree. And so he asked him, what 
are you doing here? Verse 10, private battle. Elijah replied, I have zealously, I have passionately, come on, anybody in here like that? Lord, I've served you, I've served you passionately. I've given my all to serve you. But the people, Urs might say this, if it wasn't for people, my faith would be so big. (laughs) God, I've served you passionately, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down their altars, your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. Doesn't it sound familiar? And I am the only one that is left. Oh, but now let me take a little bit further. And now they are trying to kill me. Hold on, Elijah. Who is they? Because I thought it was one person that said, by this time tomorrow, you done. Who's they? Do you realize that sometimes we can get so messed up that our perception will be off? And now he's talking like the whole nation of Israel is trying to kill him. Verse 11, I love God's response. Elijah is is gone, he's pouring out, and listen to God's response. Go out and stand before me. Did you hear what I just said, God? Sometimes we get to that place and we're praying, God, 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 speak, Lord, speak. And God directs. God, why am I going through this? Why are they, what, what? And God says, go. But Lord, I don't, I don't know what to do. God says, go. So sometimes we stop because we're waiting for this grand revelation that is going to answer everything that is going on in our life. And God says, hey, 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 listen, go. I need for you to get out of the place that you're in and I need for you to move. But sometimes we're like, I ain't moving until I know what to do. And God says, but I ain't going to give you nothing else. Move. And as you go, then I will give you the next steps. But if you stay here, you're not getting anything. So God says, go and stand out before me on the mountain. The Lord told him and Elijah stood there. And you know this part. And the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain and it was such a terrible blast that the rocks uh, were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, and after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. God's voice was not in the loud noise such as a battle at Mount Carmel, but his voice was in a gentle whisper. Here's a question. How loud are your victories? Sometimes our victories are so loud that when it becomes quiet, it becomes scary. And God, in his wisdom, gets Elijah, even in his running, in a quiet place away from the fire coming down from heaven and and, and people being slain and all of that and gets him to a place where there's no one else around, even in the midst of his running, gets him to this place where he speaks to him in a whisper. And some people are afraid of the quietness because they're afraid of what it will reveal. So they're always looking for the next public victory, the next big thing. Can we just sit and be quiet and hear what God is saying? And so God's voice is in a whisper. 
Verse 13, when Elijah heard it, when he heard God's voice, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave and a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? A voice. The first time it was the Lord's voice. This time it doesn't say it was the Lord's voice. It says that it was a voice. So whose voice was it? Is it possible that God was trying to get Elijah to the place where he could hear the voice of God again? And then when he was able to hear the voice of God, now he could hear his own voice. It does not say that God spoke twice. God spoke once. But who spoke the second time? Elijah was able to hear again like he did before. I believe that at times, God allows us to go through things so we can see what is going on within us. Verse 14, Elijah replied again, I have zealously served the Lord, the God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Verse 15, God says to him, sit down on my couch so that we can have a little conversation. It's not what God said. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came. Wow, isn't that full? See, because Elijah, at some point, You took a detour. Elijah, at some point of your life, you were following my direction. If I said go, you went. But at some point, something within you calls you to take a detour. So what I need you to do is go back the same way that you came so I can get you back on track. And when you get to that point, I want you to travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, Elijah, there's an assignment I have for you. Anoint the king, Hazel, as the king of Aram. And then verse 16, he says, then I want you to anoint Jehu, grandson of Nishma, to be the king of Israel. And by the way, I got your replacement. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Meholah to replace you as my prophet. Verse 17 says, anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape by Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Verse 18, final verse. He says, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who has never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Hold on. So the whole fear within me was what? I'm the only one. And God says to him, listen, I got 7,000 that I'm preparing that haven't even bowed down to Baal. So what you running for? Why do you keep thinking you're the only one? Is your standard too low? Is God not your standard? And so some closing thoughts. If you are doing God's work, public victory, do you also have some private battles? Think of that. What is your private battles? Is it fear? Are you passionate about doing the work of God, but you're trying to uphold a standard of someone else that came before you? Have you prayed and asked God, what is the standard that you have for my life? Elijah was passionate for God, but he kept thinking, I'm the only one. Discipleship, meet people where they are, just as the angel and God met Elijah in his private place of battle. Don't leave them there. Usher them to God. Amen?
Let me say a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Father, we've all come to this place of public victory where we can see that you're doing amazing things in our life, God. But we've also reached this place where there's private battles. You're not afraid of our private battles, God. In fact, Lord, you'll meet us right where we are. And so I just pray, God, that all of us as a community of faith, God, or even those here that may have not given their life unto you, God, I pray, God, that we will be transparent in your presence, even as Elijah did. Lord, I'm so passionate for you, but there's some stuff that's bothering me, and I don't want to do it any longer. Encourage your people today, and Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.